Well, Dr. Ivini, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast. And I wanted to start by asking you a little bit about what got you going on being really interested and fascinated about how ancient cultures have explained our origin stories. Yeah. Well, that's a long story, Mike, but let me make it brief. Um, I'm an astrophysicist. I was trained in astronomy and um, taught astronomy in a university. But at a very early age, I took a trip to Mexico with some students, and I became fascinated with the ancient Maya. And as a scientist, we're looking at people who were able to predict the movement of the planet Venus, and calculate eclipses to within minutes. And the question for, for me is, how did anybody without technology, without telescopes, without computers, with only sticks and ropes, achieve such incredible accuracy? Because science is all about the acquisition and expression of precise knowledge, isn't it? So how do you get precise knowledge if you don't have technology? Well, I learned over the years that one of the answers to that question is repetition, repetition, repetition. They just made observations every day. They time averaged over years. I got drawn more and more into other cultures of the world and what their science is like, how they acquire precise knowledge. And then, of course, the why question, why did they do that? And that's how I uh, really became an anthropologist. I hung out with anthropologists and archaeologists, and I began to learn that I think it's very important to tell the stories uh, uh, from these other cultures. And, you know, if I mention the word creation in a word test, there are going to be two responses to it. It's either going to be Genesis or the Big Bang, which are pretty far apart when you look at the text of what's written about them. But there are a host of stories of creation in between. And that's how I got interested. But I got pushed into this project to write the book Creation Stories and its predecessor, Star Stories, published last year by, of all people, the editor of Yale University Press, science and technology editor, who said to me, you know, Tony, we don't have hardly any books. We have hardly any books that talk about creation stories and the sky and that nature and the understanding of nature in cultures other than our own. By our own, I mean cultures, the dominant West European American culture, which came through the Greeks, through the Renaissance, Galileo, and all of that. Uh, and we have our explanation in the Big Bang. That's our explanation, our story, pretty interesting story, kind of a shocking story. And then, of course, alongside of that, there's the Genesis story, which is adhered to by many Christians and, and other people, you know, the, the people who are into Western religion. But nobody tells the other stories. And so uh, the editor said, why don't you do it? And I said, OK, and I did it. And so these are the stories. Well, you did a fantastic job. So when Yale University Press contacts you to do this book, and you do a tremendous amount of research to write about all these different stories, all these different perspectives, um, I love how you categorized the stories by like na using natural environments as the categories. Can you talk about that thought process and how you wanted to organize everything? Yeah, that's a good question, Mike. I suppose as an astronomer, I'm, I'm looking, always looking at the environment, of course, and where do I look? I look up. Uh, little did I realize before I began to understand some of these other cultures that the domain around us isn't divided into the earth underneath us, geology, the air around us, meteorology, and oceanography, the water, and then, of course, astronomy, the sky above us. It is one landscape. As the Popol Vuh, the story of Maya creation, which I entail in this book, says, this is all the sky earth. We speak of the creator of all the sky earth. So imagine, Mike, looking at the horizon and that dividing line that we have between the sky and the earth and thinking that it's not a dividing line. It's one thing. It's one holistic thing. And furthermore, we're a part of it. That's what landscape is. We are, we are the landscape. And so I guess my training as a scientist led me to think of, well, the environment. Uh, what is the environment? Well, mountains, waterways, caves, islands. And that's how I subdivided uh, the uh, environment. Having already talked about the sky in an entire previous book on people and constellations, star stories. 
So it seemed to me a logical way to do it. And I, as far as I know, it's not been done. So the book is about the landscapes of creation. But this is the a different kind of a, of a definition of what landscape is, not what we're used to, of course, which we would say looking out the window, the trees, and the background and the house next door and, uh, you know, and all of that. And that's not the landscape. It's not real estate. It's a lot more than real estate. Yeah. And I thought it was really interesting because um, as I was reading through your book, I never thought about how creation stories can be developed based on landscape because it never really occurred to me as you started to write about like people who lived in, in like snowy regions are going to write about creation in a different way than those who are more in more tropical places like islands. Yeah, sure. I mean, in, for the Inuit uh, in northern Canada, in the Arctic, uh, the, the creative things come out of holes in the snow. <laughs> I mean, that's what the earth is. And so there are stories about, well, the kind of, I guess I'd call them people animals, people animals, one word, uh, that before us, there were these other kinds of, shall I say, species. I don't want to get too Darwinian on you, but, you know, this is a certain way of thinking uh, that, that there were these predecessors before us. They were people animals, and they would pop up out of the snow. In uh, Nullarbor in southwest Australia, where you have a female deity responsible for creation, they come out of caves. And so my section on caves deals with creation that takes place under the ground. The Maya story, one of the most fascinating. In the case of Japan, of course, Japan is an island. So the Shinto myth has to do with islands, Polynesian myths, the Hawaiian myth, uh, where uh, our hero goes fishing uh, and pulls up the island of Hawaii out of the sea. Fascinating story. Where do you think islands come from? Well, they do come out of the sea. So when you start reading these myths, as they're called, and we should talk about what a myth is, when we read these stories, these myths, we find that people aren't all that different from us. They want to know what's going on in the environment around them, where they fit in. Where did it all come from? How do I fit in? How does it all make sense? We've got to make sense out of it. And sense means it's got to be politics, history, uh, religion, how you deal with the dead. I mean, we've got to make sense out of all of that. So, yeah, so the stories are categorized. I thought the best way to do it would be by sacred landscapes. Yeah, and you just mentioned the term myth, and I, I would love to talk to you about that because you talk about in your book around how that's, a to you, a, a double-barreled term. Mm -hmm. That's the way you called it. Can you talk mm -hmm. about um, how we should define myth, how you think about myth? Well, there are two, two definitions of that. Of course, a myth is a story. And my book is really about storytelling. That's why I opened up with a joke about storytelling. I hope you were amused by it. A lot of people don't get it. Uh, but I won't go over the joke because we don't have to analyze it. Just read page one, your readers. Um, storytelling and the human imagination. Now, of course, our story is a scientific story. It's a story of the Big Bang. It's a story of a universe of which we don't seem to be a part. We're not a part of that universe. That's kind of scary. In other words, the Big Bang, responsible for our creation, happened in an instant 14 billion years ago. What do you make of that? Everything that's happening, your shirt, my eyeballs are looking at each other, all of that is the result of an event that took place in a flash 14 billion years ago. It's a scary story, and we're still looking for a place in it. We're trying to find our place in it. A myth is, for me, simply a story that we devise to explain our place in the universe. The universe, I got to put in quotation marks. This is the landscape, of course. Not when I say universe, I don't mean necessarily the vast, distant cosmos. I mean what's around us and what affects us most profoundly. The other definition of myth, which I challenge, is that a myth is a story waiting for science to debunk it. In other words, it's a magical story quote, all made up, quote, all made up. It isn't just all made up. It's related, in any case, a well thought out story, a story with legs, a story that has meaning through the ages told by a good storyteller, does do the best it can to make sense of where we are and what we're doing and how we're living and so on. So it's either a made up story waiting for science to debunk it, or a very meaningful story devised and told to explain our place 
in the environment landscape. What did you find like interesting and unique about these stories that give them legs, as you described? Like what makes them so interesting that we want to keep passing them on? Well, it's the uh, it, having legs means having the ability to adapt um, to cultural change. And one of the examples, among others, that I give is about the Yama in the Andes who gives birth to her baby. The Yama is the most vital animal in the Andes. Uh, if you ever go there to the ruins in Cusco and um, the Intihuatana and um, Machu Picchu in particular, the, mm. you see the Yama. And the Yama is just the, the center of that culture. You, you depend on the Yama for the meat. Uh, you depend on the Yama for the skin, uh, for uh, warmth the bones to make tools and so on for ages, the Yama is the most important. And the most prominent constellation in the sky, to refer to my earlier book on star stories, is the Indian Yama. It's made up of dark clouds of the Southern Milky Way. It's a dark cloud constellation, not a star to star constellation. How weird is that? I mean, Orion yeah. is stars. The Pleiades are stars. These are dark clouds. It happens that when the Yama drinks the water, when she dives into the western horizon after sunset in November, rain comes, timed with the rainy season. The landscape and what happens to the landscape dependent on the Yama story. Now, why does that story of the Yama have legs? Situated next to the Yama and her baby suckling underneath her is the fox, Atok. And the fox is there crouched waiting to snatch that baby, snatch that baby away from the Yama. Uh, now, when the story yeah. traveled eastward into the tropical rainforest in the Amazon basin, the carnivore predator fox becomes a jaguar who chases a tapir, the A-P-I-R, a, a huge rodent. And the tapir is the yama. So the predator, the fox, and the prey, the yama, become the predator, a jaguar in the Amazon, and the prey, a taper who was often seen making pathways through the jungle and muddy, muddy looking pathways. Now, when you go farther down toward the Gran Chaco, you know, we're talking about getting down to Argentina, the taper becomes a deer because you have a forest. So the deer is the prey. Uh, and then even farther south, all the way down to the tip of Tierra del Fuego, what happens is the predator and the prey switch places. They actually switch places, um, and the predator is the dog, and the prey is a rhea, or a South American ostrich. Well, I couldn't remember all these names. So they actually change place, uh, only this time because of the ostrich's long neck, much like the yamas. So it makes sense to have them switch places. Pursuer and pursued switch places in the sky. That's a great story. Uh, and it's as enduring as a Genesis, Genesis kind of story, which the Genesis, of course, would appeal to any uh, race of people who are uh, uh, cast aside, who are slaves, who are who have wants and needs but can't acquire them because they're dominated by other people. And so they need that all-purpose God who can rescue them from that and guarantee them safety, a real savior. So that's how the I think it's a good example in the Andes of how yeah. – they change places. That is so interesting. What do you know, like in that particular story, as you described how different regions took that story and applied it to their animal life, like the time periods, like how that kind of traveled down? Well, we do because we know that in the case of the Amazon, that there was correspondence and a communication between the people uh, in the Andean highlands now imagine the map of the coast of South America where the Andes are the continuation of our Rocky Mountains that go all the way down to Sierra Madres through Mexico and then all the way down the west coast, if you will, of South America. Uh, between those people and the people immediately to the east, there's a steep slope that takes you down into the Amazon. And these people were trading. Uh, I mean, there were goods created in the lowlands. Cotton, for example, was farmed in the lowlands adjacent to the Andes. And that was transported to the highlands. So there were traders, you know, like two guys go into a bar kind of a thing. I mean, uh, in their spare time, they would tell these stories. You know, we have this constellation of the Yama. 
and there's the fox, and the fox is going to kill the yama and get the baby. And uh, and then, of course, the, the guy in the bar picks up the story. It's like the game of, you know, when I tell you a story, you tell it to the next person, and he tells it to the next person. You change the story to suit the area because, I mean, somebody else might say, well, we, what's a yama? We don't have foxes around here. But, you know, the jaguar – the jaguar and the uh, bird, they behave that way. So the stories just get told in the course of conversation. We yeah. know these stories go back a long way. I mean, the the Indian Yama story is well accounted for uh, by the Spanish chroniclers who come to Peru in the 15th, 16th century. Uh, and they were recorded on knotted strings, kipu which go back even farther. So who knows how far back those stories wow. go. I imagine to the early millennia AD, at least, maybe even earlier, as long as Yamas were the beast of burden. Wow. What are the, the earliest that you know of? Well, they're the Chinese creation story. If we're just talking about stories of creation now, is that your question? Yeah. yeah I mean, we know the Chinese story of creation goes back before the current epoch. Uh, the story of the uh, uh, Pangu, P-A-N-G-U, that I that I uh, talk about, who is uh, comes along with an axe and chops open an egg, the egg of creation, and out of that egg he chops all of the things that make mountains and river valleys and streams, and it's interesting in the uh, in the case of the Chinese creation. Of course, there are always these. Other gods and goddesses who were involved, once Pangu sets up the earth and gets it all organized into the landscape that we know, uh, the female deity, Nuwa, comes along and creates life, he being the mother figure, and she creates plants and animals and so on. But enter Gong Gong, which is a great name. Gong Gong, you could just imagine like a bong, he bangs his head. He's the evil god who wants to destroy what the mother has created, I suppose, gender disagreements there. He goes around banging his head up against the, all the pillars and mountains to destroy what she made. Uh, and before she can defeat him, he manages, manages to knock down a lot of the mountains in the east side so that if you look at China's landscape, it's tilted. Uh, the landscape of China is tilted. Now you take out a map of China and look at it. You'll see the Yangtze and the other two or three major rivers all flow from west to east, from the high mountains uh, on the east side. I'm sorry, fl flow from west to east, the high mountains on the east side of China, all the way down to the deltas in Beijing and on the west side. Got my directions right. And so I suppose a little kid could ask Mama, how come? The landscape of China is tilted. You know, why is it that when we always we go that way, we go up, we go this way, we go down? And a wonderful story to remember how the landscape is, is by enchanting it with these deities who have a battle, and Gong Gong has knocked down the pillars, and that's why the landscape is tilted. Now, we can say those are just so stories that they're not truths. I think there is truth in myth, because the myth does tell you about the nature of the landscape. Now, we're always looking for the scientific reason. we got to look to geology to try to understand forces, natural forces in the universe that have nothing to do with us who explain that environment. These other cultures didn't tap into that way of knowing. It's simply one way, another way of knowing. In our case, it's knowing a universe of which we're not a part. And we opted for that. Some will say in the Renaissance, the great scientific Renaissance in the 15th century, 16th century, I will say it goes all the way back to the Greeks. And you can read my Greek origin myth, you know, the whole story of how that came about in the Theogony. And it, it is it's a little different from the others. And, and that's how we end up with our Big Bang. I don't want to give away the whole story, but that's the last chapter, you know, where I try yeah, to yeah. show that our Big Bang is not that different. Uh, but we're still in a quandary, as I think the Chinese were trying to explain everything. We're still trying to make sense out of what's going on around us. So we're all in the same earth. We're all in the same basket, if you will. By the way, I, I really loved reading um, the Navajo section and your footnote on Wiley the Coyote. I was cracking yeah. up. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, um, I really enjoyed reading that. And uh, I never realized about how 
animal life and coyotes were a huge part of Navajo tradition. Yeah. Well, the Navajo have it. It's interesting that I guess maybe the best general answer to that. First, the footnote. All the stuff about Wiley Coyote is in the footnote because my London editor said, we don't know who Wiley Coyote is. I had to put that in the footnote to explain who he is. It was hilarious. But what's really interesting is that for a lot of these cultures, I think the Maya, the Maya and the Tlingit from the Northwest Coast, like the Navajo, to name three cultures, if you ask them, what is the, the epitome of the quality of a great human being, you know, we might say strong, brave, wise, having muscles. In the case of these cultures, and especially the Navajo, it's about trickery, to be, be able to outsmart your opponent through trickery. And it's the coyote who does that with the Navajo. He is featured in many, many creation stories. He is, he is uh, the, the hero because of the tricks he plays on people. He's like the raven of the Tlingit. And there's a wonderful story of the raven who is, spends his time addling up and down the northwest coast, you know, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia. That would be what we call that territory today. Uh, and the story, one of the stories I tell is that where did fresh water come from? He's paddling his canoe in um, salt water. So that's a big deal, you know. You get these two kinds of water here. You have the same problem in the in the southern Iraq, and, and there's the story of the Enuma Elish, about the encounter between fresh and salt water in the Gulf, Persian Gulf. Similar kind of thing. Where, where does it come from? And it's a wonderful story because the raven tricks the, the god who harbors all the water. He keeps it all in a tank in his house. And uh, it's up to raven to figure out how to get the water from him, to bring it to people. So he befriends the guy who has all the water, the god who has the water, uh, and is invited to help him keep up the house. So he does his god of the fresh water. And one day he tricks him into uh, going out into the bush to cleanse himself because he has had an accident. Uh, and he goes out to cleanse himself, and the raven takes a bucket of urine, says, here, let me clean you, brother, and he <laughs> pours the urine on his head. And the guy is blinded, and he can't see anything, and he's sputtering, sputtering around. Meanwhile, the raven goes in, taps the water, uh, fills his belly full of all he can drink, destroys the rest. His magical belly is full enough to supply water to all the people. He leaves no water for the owner of the water and goes off and gives the water to the people. But it's about trickery. It's about tricking him to go off into the woods because he messed himself. And as you can't clean yourself <laughs> here, I'll clean you. So there's a lot of shit and piss in the story, you know, a lot of excrement, and, and there are all kinds of bodily fluids in these stories. But they're real. I mean, there is real. Who would think of bodily fluids in the Big Bang? But the, those are real things that we think. What is all this stuff that comes out of my body? Where's all that stuff come from, you know? And um, these are stories that try to deal with these rather basic questions. So I have, I know we're up at our time. I had one, one last question. So as you've studied um, all these various myths, and uh, you mentioned that kind of the dominant myth that we all kind of know is the creation story we see in Genesis, especially mm -hmm. here in, in the West. Have, have you seen like ways that the, the Genesis story has been, has been influenced by any other myths? Well, of course, there we don't know. I, I think the best we can say from the historical record that the Genesis is an agglomeration of stories that come from the Middle East over periods of thousands of years. But what's significant about Genesis makes it a lot like other stories that we have, is that it's about the formation of the world from chaos from a previously undifferentiated state into the world we now know it. Now, if you move over into Mesopotamia, Tigris and the Euphrates, the undifferentiated state that you would see if you lived in the Persian Gulf Delta 
where the Tigris and Euphrates merge and then drain into the Delta. The undifferentiated state is the fog and the mist that you have where the waters meet, where the sweet water that comes down from the Zagros Mountains flows through the rivers and meets the salt water of the sea. And the myth that's told there is much more animated than the Genesis, is the conflict between the female fresh water, the, the, the female salt water, Tiamat, who is also the goddess of the storm, because that's where all the storms come from, and the male, Apsu, which is the fresh water. And the conflict is there, and it's resolved generationally. They, they engage, the male and the female, the sweet and the salt water, engage in battles ferocious battles, and you can see these battles depicted in sculpture, I mean, the, as, as old as 1000, 1500 BC, goes way back, uh, and then it doesn't get resolved until generations later, uh, when, believe it or not, the offspring have to kill their mother, they have to kill the salt water deity, not, not a nice thing for us to do, but they have to kill the mother, of course, the stories are told by guys. We have to realize that. There's, it's, it's not a female. It's not a story told by women. It's a story told by men. So, of course, the men get to do the dominating. But that whole story of the creation of an undifferentiated world, a chaotic world, uh, that foggy mist uh, at the confluence of the fresh and sweet water, is retold in Genesis, but not in those stark animated terms. There it's told by a single deity who Stepwise, day by day, creates one part of the universe after another. How he does it, we don't know. Well, he does it by word. He speaks, and the word creates. Very, very abstract. But the point I think that's worth making is that Genesis is one among a host of stories about creation out of some undifferentiated state. Um, and, and that's where they... See, I want to try to see if I can find similarities among these stories rather than just saying they're all different all these right. stories are myths and then there's our story which is the true story and i think that's that's oversimplifying storytelling yeah for sure do, do you have a favorite out of all these stories well i uh i guess the popol vu since i'm biased toward the maya is my favorite the popol vu is the creation of the world as we know it on the top of the world by the hero twins hero twins who are sent by a higher authority to go down into the underworld. This is under caves, and, uh, you know, the Maya coast is riddled with cenotes, these underground wells that you may know if oh. you've ever visited Maya ruins. Mm -hmm. They have to go into the underworld uh, and trick the gods of the underworld so they can get control uh, and create then what's above land. And they do it by auto-sacrifice. That doesn't mean... That doesn't mean um, sacrificing your car. It means sacrificing yourself. They put on a show for these underworld gods. It's so beautifully depicted in ceramics, ceramic art, beautiful Maya ceramic art, almost oh, wow. like cartoons. And they trick these underworld deities by sacrificing a dog and bringing it back to life. The underworld deities can't believe it. How do you do that? And then, finally, one of the brothers says, well, wait, you see this one. He takes his twin brother, lays him on a stone slab and cuts his heart out and kills his brother. And then in a flash, he brings his brother back to life. Brings oh. his brother back to life. He has the power to do that. And this is where the underworld gods say, that's amazing, do it to us, do it to us. Because we can't imagine a greater thrill than being killed and brought back to life. Well, you know what happens. They, uh, the twins very slyly uh, omit step number two. They sacrifice the underworld gods, actually the chief of the underworld god, uh, gods, and don't bring him back to life. And that ends up with the collapse of the underworld gods. Uh, they can't deal with it anymore. They're banished into the caverns of Yucatan. Uh, and then the twins go up to the surface of the earth waiting for the dawn, because we've got to get all this done before the sun rises and time begins, and they create the environment. They create the water and the caves and all the other things uh, so that when they create people, uh, when they create people, they'll have a place to live. And the last task is to create the maize people, as they call them, who is us. They create them and make them out of corn, 
that's where humans come from. You are what you eat. And that's, of course, <laughs> corn. You, if you've ever had a really good tortilla, not the flour <laughs> kind, you know that yeah. that is the staple of, Mes Me of Central America. Uh, and so it's a beautiful story. Uh, the, the tortilla people created after the uh, hero twins trick uh, the uh, gods of the underworld by killing them and not bringing them back to life. What a great story. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I love um, I love these stories of trickery. <laughs> Those are so much fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't think of trickery. We think of trickery as being maybe a dishonest, don't we, in our culture? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, he tricked me. Uh, you know, they tricked us into the election. <clears throat> it was trickery that they, they indulged in. Well, trickery is a laudable human trait. More important, that's the hero. That's what heroism is in that culture. It's about trickery. And it's interesting yeah. how you've got a raven over here and a coyote over there, and then you've got hero twins down there. And I, I don't know. Did that all diffuse from one great storyteller who lived 5,000 years ago? Maybe. Yeah. And I think about in the Genesis story, the serpent kind of tricks Eve. I don't know. Is there trickery there? Yeah, yeah he does. Evil. But he's evil, isn't he? Huh? An evil serpent who does that. And uh, uh, from there comes, of course, our... And this is a big debatable point in anthropology. Uh, is that where the fear of snakes comes from, or is a fear of snakes a natural thing? Is it a cultural universal? I don't know the answer to that question, but uh, yeah, that, that he's a trickery. He's a trickster snake, but a bad guy, not a good guy. Yeah. Well, Dr. Davini, I want to thank you so much for your time, for sharing your, your brand new book, which is just filled with so many great stories. If you were talking to kids, like what would be a good story to tell a child during bedtime? <laughs> well, you don't want to scare <laughs> them to death. I wouldn't yeah, tell exactly. them a story about. I don't know if I'd tell them the story about suicide, <laughs> but I don't know. I kind of like the story about the uh, the story that comes from Egypt about the Nile. It answers the obvious questions. Daddy, where did the pyramids come from? Well, they uh -huh. came from Ben Ben. And the Ben Bens are the little silt piles. This would be nice told to a story, told to a kid who maybe lives near uh, near the shore or near a waterway. You know, you see all those little piles of mud. They grow up to be pyramids, but it's the deity who was responsible for making that change. And he has to pass through the underworld at night. So as you're going to bed at night saying your prayers or not, uh, you can think about the god in the West who wants to prevent the sun wants to keep that sun god from riding his chariot down into the west so he can come back up in the east in the morning. And he indulges in all kinds of activities, but he's he never succeeds because the sun rises the next day. Yeah, I mean, that's got, it's not a humorous plot, but I, the, I think trickster, the, 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 the trickster stories involving the raven, and there are many of them yeah. in the book, are kind of fun, as are the coyote stories. So you can look at those, I think, and find uh, some interesting uh, uh, things. How Maui dredged up the Hawaiian Islands is kind of fun, uh, where he, he's he got his brothers there, and he's in his canoe out in the middle of an ocean. There's no land there, of course, and you'd come up with this if you lived in Hawaii, where there hardly is hardly any land. And his brothers are in the story, and he fishes up a beautiful maiden, uh, kind of like a, a mermaid. And she's sitting in the back of the boat, and the brothers are gawking at her. Wow, she's cool. And the brother, the 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 uh, our hero, Maui, Maui, which is the name of the island, the name of the hero, says, "Don't look at her. Don't look at her. Look the other way." And they look the other way, and he casts in his line, and he pulls up the island after which he's no, the main island of Hawaii. He pulls that up, and the island is floating, and he's going to make a whole world out of that. But the brothers can't resist. They turn around and look again, uh, and he has to drop the line, and Hawaii ends up floating as an island, and it's not the entire earth. It's just an island that he caught um, with his fish hook, magic fish hook. That magic fish hook is featured in a Disney movie, and I'm having trouble thinking of the name of it right now, but there is a Disney movie. What is yeah, it? Yeah, Moana. 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 Exactly, yeah. So you yeah. want to know about the Disney movie? That's a good place to start that off. I'm yeah. sure the mother can tell it better than I can. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fantastic. Um, yeah. Look, Dr. Ravini, I want to thank you so much for, for being on the podcast. Glad to do it, uh, Mike. And um, 
good luck with it. And I hope I sell billions of books. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Good but, to talk uh, to you.